Hey everybody, welcome to the Good Evening Kitties podcast, a Tales from the Crypt review. My name is Melissa, your ghostess with the mostess, and today's episode is season 7, episode 10, About Face. I have with me back to guest host Mike. Hi Mike, thanks for being back. I rolled out of bed for this. Yeah, you rolled out of bed for this. Yeah. You turned 360 out of bed or 180. Oh, 360? <laughs> <laughs> I just, no, this is from bed right now. Okay. Yes. So I guess 180. Very professional. 180 will make sense later with this episode. So yeah, like I said, about face. I thought I'd have you on because it's a weird episode and it's kind of squeamy and it's it's fun. It's just kind of silly. It's but, fun for people with religious baggage. Yeah, well, and it's fun because it's one of those weird last minute, oh my gosh, can you believe this is what it really is kind of thing. Another little hint here. We're also going to be talking probably a little bit about Malignant, the movie Malignant. So if, if you have not seen that movie. Then don't. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say it's gonna get spoiled but yeah uh, I mean honestly it didn't it was okay it didn't do a whole lot for me but it was it was fine I know a lot of people really liked it and if you a lot of people didn't like it but if you don't take it seriously it's okay yeah I mean it was a fun ride for what it was my biggest thing is you can't go ahead and make an accidental comedy and then claim that you meant it that way mm. it's kind of like the same situation we have with the, with the room also, just one thing about Malignant with that movie. <gasps> Gus, hi! Gus Podcat. is here. Podcat. Hi, Gus. We doing? You got things to say about Malignant? Uh, he said he liked it. Yeah, he's going to beat me up. No, there's just one thing about that movie, too. Like, she was, for Malignant, some spoilers here, she was a nurse. She's pregnant, and she gets this head contusion of, like, thrown against the wall. I mean, I know she's scared, and, and she called the cops and all that, but, like, she also just goes to sleep, and then anytime she wakes up and her head is still bleeding, she just never goes to the hospital. And, and I'm like, yeah. And never, I'm like, you're a nurse. Never checks it. You've miscarried babies before. Like, wouldn't you be so worried? Other than that, I mean, it's... This it's, has nothing to do is, with the episode. It does have a little bit. <laughs> it does have a little bit. So, again, Season 7, Episode 10, About Face. Let's get into it. As always, John Kassir is the voice of the Crypt Keeper, and Danny Elfman does the theme song. This episode aired June 28th, 1996. It is directed by Thomas E. Sanders, who only directed this episode. This is the only thing he's ever directed. He was mostly a production designer. And the screenplay was by Gilbert Adler and A.L. Katz. It stars Anthony Andrews from movies like The King's Speech and The Scarlet Pimpernel. Amelda Staunton from uh, movies like Vera Drake, and she was also Dolores Umbridge in all the Harry Potter movies, and Anna Friel from TV's Pushing Daisies, and Marcella. I'm going to go ahead here and read the back of the box for Season 7, Episode 10, About Face. Dead to rights, a priest's sexual indiscretions come calling in the form of two vengeful daughters. So, Season 7, Episode 10, About Face. Of course, it opens up with the Crypt Keeper, there's a little jazz club going on down in the crypt. Uh, a lot of people, well, it's skeletons. Skeletons in fun little outfits. They even have cigarettes that are smoking in their mouths. And you got the Crypt Keeper up there, and he's the musical act. And you get to see all of him this time. He's in the suit. He's got a guitar. Is that a fedora, I Mike? mean, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a fedora. I don't know. Someone would probably yell at me and be like, it's a Hamburg or something like that, but I don't know. So he's got a little hat and sunglasses, and you get to see the whole puppet and his feet. He's got these little, like, jazzy little feet. He doesn't have any shoes on. He's kicking along, and he's making jokes and singing a little jazzy song. But yeah, so then he brings in the episode about face. Here we go. So this one starts out, I mean, there always is in season seven, there's a lot of, like, incidental music. This one starts out really, uh, like, just bombarding you with different stuff. <laughs> so this is a, a period episode. It opens up and they're in a, like a brothel, you know, like a whorehouse or whatever, like an old timey gentleman's club. And there's just a lot of music and like, da -na -na, and there's just like smoking um, cigarettes and dancing and laughing. This one couple uh, is heading down to the room, to a room there because they're going to, you know, he's going to partake of her services. And then so you got all these different sounds of the music. And then you also got all these different moans that all mean different things. So you got someone like laughing. Ah, ha, ha, and then you got other moans of like, ah, yeah. And then you got like, <laughs> <laughs> and then you got these moans of like screaming. And then you got like these moans of just like really screaming. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, the Kool-Aid man is there. And then there's a, a woman here who's heading down to a back room with a basin of water. And the other, the really violent screaming is coming from the back room because this, I mean, basically girl, she's pretty young. I think she's like maybe 18, is giving birth. And she's back there and she's screaming. So it's like oh, it's so much chaos. She's living there or whatever. And so she's giving birth and she's screaming. 
and there's a cross there's a lot of religious imagery and stuff in this because it's basically around like a reverend and stuff or a I guess he's a reverend she's there and she's got like her little like cross she's holding and there's like another cross there's all these crosses and she's freaking out and it's terrible because you see these flashbacks and you find out how she got pregnant and she got pregnant from the reverend like you do <laughs> no like you don't do <laughs> it was disturbing yes yeah do you want to explain it or want me to explain I it? I mean, what is there to explain? It's Well, just... I'm going to point out what happened because this is annoying. I mean, I know it's part of the script, but it's like, it's just so hard to see. Like, so she was a maid at the, at the church she lived in and worked at or whatever. And it shows her like in the, I mean, there's w- words for it, but like the, basically where the church is. So she's in the church on like an altar. I was raised isolationist fundamentalist. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So, so she's up on like the altar thing. And she's in this white dress and you see the priest and he's basically raping her, but he's also making it like this is God's will. Yeah, this is a good thing yeah. that I'm doing to you. This is what God wants. And it's really messed up. It was. I was like, this is a lot because he's praying as he's, you know, doing what he's doing and acting like it's this gift and this whole thing. Yeah, pretty gross. Yeah. And so she's here and she's giving birth to this baby. The lady who is delivering the baby is like, I don't care what you said and I don't care what I said. I want to know who did this to you, you know. And so the woman giving birth is sad because she, she's praying while she's giving birth because she's, she's afraid she sinned. And that's the part that really get me because it's like the Reverend made her feel this was her fault too. Like she enjoyed mm. it or asked for it or something. And so she's going to die thinking that she is sinning because she does not make it through childbirth. So then real quick at the end, like the baby is born and there's a lot like there's tons of um, sheets and things that are bloody. So, you know, it's going bad. Like it's she's oh, hemorrhaging. Yeah. She screams. She pushes the baby out. And for a very split second, it's a blink. You'll miss it. The lady who catches the baby, you don't see the baby, but she kind of the lady who catches it gets this look of like, oh, my God. Like she's <laughs> she's like completely astounded. And then it just cuts to 16 years later. To be fair, that could be just a regular birth, too. <laughs> I mean, true. She was hemorrhaging, but the and lady... <laughs> it is pretty gnarly. Yeah. It cuts to 16 years later, and we're outside a very, like, nice... Well, there's first of all, there's a nice little pony, little horse. And a really cool... Um... Handsome cab? No, Happiness, what is this what thing? Called? Ha- handsome cab? Handsome cab. I want to say... Oh, handsome cab. Yeah, it's just basically like the... Not handsome. More like handsome. Maybe okay, handsome. so it's like I the don't... type of cart car thing you sit in that you hook the horse to (laughs) i learned stuff from sherlock holmes and they're in front of this really big building that's the church and also where the reverend lives coming out of the cart is this girl and then it starts out with the reverend who is played um reverend jonathan he is played by anthony andrews and he is playing it well because he's a piece of crap And he's there talking to some guy about his book. He does like book tours and, you know, is trying to spread his good works through the church. Which we never really get an idea. Like it's it's kind of implied that he has like an alternate philosophy or some sort of alternative like theology that he's trying to push. That he even tries to push to believe on himself. They have a really cool like library office room in here that he's in. And then he's talking to the guy about his possible book tour with a new book that he wrote. He goes around, he does talks around the area. His reputation is very important to him. And so they're talking and talking and all that stuff. And he's very kind of full of himself. And he's wearing a giant cross on his neck, like a very big... Which is something that like made confused me for a bit. Because whenever you think Anglican, you think, well, this is like soft Catholicism. You know, this is like not full, like hardcore, you're not as hardcore as like Reformation stuff, like Calvinists. Mm. You're not like as straightforward as Lutherans. You're like, well, I'd like the pomp and circumstance, but at the same time, like having a huge honking cross, something that you think, well, that's more Catholic, isn't it? (laughs) So I was confused at first, but then he's got a wife. So I'm like, well, that's not, uh, that's that's why we're like, you find out, yeah, when you find out he's married to uh, Mel DeStanton's character, Sarah, you're like, oh, well then, you know, okay. So yeah, I think it is. Probably more probably Anglican. Yeah. You know, he's talking to the guy who's gonna help him, and then his wife comes in, Sarah, who at first I thought was his sister, just the way she was acting, because they don't seem to really care for each other. Um, from like the get-go. You can tell she's already walking in, like, hey, and she walks in and she overhears that he needs to get another secretary to help him like take notes and things like that for his upcoming book and all that stuff. And so she walks in and she's like, and Amelda Staunton's great in this. She walks in and she's got this really like, you know, the dress with the, the thing all the way up to the neck. and Yes, very proper. Very proper. And she walks in and she's like, 
another secretary. Dubai said he just runs through all these women like He crazy. does. Maids, secretaries, all this stuff. They only stay for a certain amount of time. And she's on to him. She knows why. She's willing to turn a blind eye as long as it doesn't ruin their reputations. Because their marriage is basically for reputation. Yeah. They live in a very nice place and she wants to keep it that way. But it is also talked about that they no longer lie together. <laughs> but she, she does not miss being with Which him. Which I don't blame her. Yeah, she know. does not miss being with him whatsoever. I could blame her for other things, but, you know. Well, I don't think she's too bad. I mean, she, she should have probably just left. But also at that time, a woman of her means and that, how much would she really get if they were to get divorced? Like her, you know, I mean, she would have maybe, I don't know. I'm not sure how the laws work with all that back then. With Not well for her, probably. Probably not. So she's like, hey, you have a visitor. And he's like, well, I only take visitors on appointment. So tell them to leave. And she's like, oh, no, you want to see this one. Jonathan, there's someone here to see you. Well, you know very well that I never see anyone without an appointment, Sarah, so tell them to come back another day. I think you ought to see this person now. Alone. It's quite all right, Reverend. I've got a lot of work to do. Oh, do you still want me to arrange for you to see Miss Pilcher today, the new secretary? Oh, another one. So soon. So they send off that guy, and in comes a girl who's about 16. She's played by Anna Friel. She comes in and she's like, hey, Reverend, you my dad. Father. Yeah, father. And really, it's like, at that time, it's not like they could really prove it. Like, if he really wanted to deny it, what would she do? It was 16 years prior. True. And it's not like they had DNA. So she shows up and she's like, my mom was a, a maid that used to work here. And when she got pregnant, she was sent away. That's when Sarah, Imelda Staunton's character, is like, oh, I remember her. Her name was Emma. Angelica, sir. Angelica. Well, now, what a pretty name. Do sit down. Thank you. Now, what on earth makes you think that I could possibly be your father? The woman who took care of us always said you were. Our mother told her. Our mother? I'm sorry, I don't understand. I have a twin sister, sir. Oh, two of you. Oh, how charming. I appreciate, miss, you may well have been told certain things, but the fact of the matter is... Our mother used to work here, sir, as a maid. When she was with child, she was forced to leave. A maid? Yes, I remember her. She was called Emma. Surely you haven't forgotten her, Jonathan. Where is your mother now? What uh, happened to her? She died after giving birth to us. Angelica says that there is another one. She has a twin sister. They're like, well, what happened to your mom? Well, she died at childbirth. He killed this girl because she was probably way too young. Like, it's just really sad to me that she died feeling like she was this sinner and she was probably only like 16 yeah. or something. Maybe she couldn't even, you know, at the time she was having twins, you know, and it's like, you don't know, it just probably, it just, she just died really horribly. He automatically suspects her of trying to get out something out from him, which I'd imagine that he's probably had this conversation many times before. Probably, You yeah. know. Well, and she's just like, I only want to know my father and love him, and we have nowhere else to go. So he asks her to go wait outside, and when he does, Sarah, he and Sarah are talking, and Sarah's like, oh, you've done this, done it now. We are going to get screwed, because now there's someone who actually can claim that she's your daughter, which makes me wonder if they haven't had this And situation. she's well-spoken and obviously educated, and that means yeah. that she'll be, the people will pay attention to her. If it was just some, you know, someone who was like a, you know, from the streets... Which is probably what a lot of his well, again, offspring have been. She has nowhere um, to go. Yeah, she would have yeah. probably end up that way. But uh, but no, she is a member of the middle class. She will bring us down if we don't give her what she wants. But yeah, it kind of makes it seem like maybe he didn't, he hasn't done this before, or at least Sarah doesn't know he's done this before. Well, I think that she's you've done it now, as in like, oh, well, this one could be dangerous. The others, you know, we can cover up or bribe, but this one is dangerous. Well, yeah, because there also is probably record that this Emma worked there yes. too. And then there's two of them. There's two daughters. So it's not even like, you know, they could both collaborate the story or whatever. So then they Cor have- You mean corroborate? So they could both corroborate the story together. <laughs> So yeah, so Sarah is just mad. She's doing a really good, she, really good job. She's got her wine and she's, Amilda Staunton is, and she's just like, you know what? I am so glad I don't have to sleep with you anymore. And I don't want to put everything at risk that we have that we've been working on with our marriage this whole time, this marriage of convenience. And so at first he was thinking like maybe he could just send her away. It's not like anyone could really prove it. But then for some reason, 
I guess because he's about to go on this book tour. And maybe he does really want to know her, I don't know. But he decides to take them in. Because he's like, well, this will look great to the con- congregation. Right, right. He's more, it's it's much, more, the way his mind works, I don't, I think it's less fear of what she could do to his reputation and more, okay, I could make this look good for me. Yeah. So he's like, cool. So Angelica, go get your sister, get your things, and then come back and you can stay here in our giant house. And she's like, oh my gosh, so excited. Thank you. What in God's name have you just done? A family. It's the perfect image. And where should we say they came from? Oh, I don't know. Let's say that we adopted them. What greater act of goodness is them? So then Angelica shows up and she's like unpacking and everything like that and talking with her father. He's like, well, where's your your sister Leia? And she's like, oh, she's in the bathroom. She's really shy and she's kind of troubled and she feels bad that she was abandoned by her dad. And Jonathan's like, I didn't even know you existed. But it's also like she got pregnant and you knew how she got pregnant and then you sent her away. So you're still responsible. Yeah. But Angelica still, like, wants to love him and loves him. She's always had this, like, idea of him. He's like, well, I'll just talk with Leia tomorrow. We'll figure it out, whatever. And she's like, cool, I'll talk to my sister. So later that night, because this, ep- I mean, this this has only been, like, a, a day or two. Like, this episode doesn't waste any time. I will give it credit. The writing is somewhat tight. Yeah. I mean, it's not bad. The The decor is great. The people, the acting is great. At first, I was a little confused, which I'll explain later, but then it ended up being okay. So it cuts to later that night, and Sarah, Amelda Stunton's character, is still drinking that wine. She's just like, I'm going to get blitzed. I'm just going to assume it's brandy. Or yeah, whatever she's drinking. She's got to take in these daughters now. She's like in the living room, and then the door opens, and this Angelica comes in, or starts to come in, but you can't quite see her. And Sarah's like, are you okay? Is everything all right? And she gets closer. You can see it's not Angelica. It's Angelica's twin, Leia, and Leia besides being troubled, has some sort of skin condition that makes it look like her skin is peeling and cracked. She really doesn't look that bad. I mean, like, no. it looks it looks like she might just need some lotion. But Amelda Staunton's character acts as if it's the most revolting thing <laughs> she's ever seen in her life. And so she immediately starts yelling at her all this stuff, like all this biblical stuff. And um, she, of course, does not... She, she sees the vicar or whatever he is for what he truly is, a fraud. I'm the other one. Your sister said you were twins. Yes, but as you can see, we're not exactly identical. No, unfortunately for you. Cure thyself of the affliction of caring how you appear to others. Concern yourself only with how you appear to God. I don't, uh, I don't recognize the verse. Speak the truth, woman. You find me hideous, don't you? No, I wouldn't say hideous. And what would you say? Foul. Ugly. Horrid. Um, Exactly. Judge not lest ye be judged. When was the last time you lay with your husband? (laughs) Has he not cast you aside for the company of harlots? Who told you that? No one. It's in my blood. It's my heritage. Our marriage is about other things. A man like him, he's married to the church, really. She's immediately yelling at Sarah, like, the, the whole, um, don't judge, even though she's kind of judging. But, uh, she's yelling at Sarah for not laying with her husband. Sarah goes to defend Jonathan. And she does this thing where she's like, well, I mean, he's a man, isn't he? And then she's like, don't defend him. Do not defend him. He is demon seed. What did you expect? He's a man, isn't he? A man who abandoned his children. Right. I mean, the whole, like, I'm just a man defense does not work in a truly religious setting. I mean, hell, if you go back even before Christianity, Marcus Aurelius used to put people in their place for using that excuse. Yeah, because she's like, he is demon seed. And (laughs) Leia says he's demon seed. And Sarah's like, well, I mean, he's a man, isn't he? Kind of a fun scene. It's a good little, like, monologue. So then Leia holds up the cross, which is probably the cross her mom had. And she starts like praying to the Lord and things like that. And then it cuts to the next morning. Sarah is meeting Jonathan at breakfast. And she's like, you know what? Okay, so I met Leah last night. (laughs) And he's like, oh, you met her? And she's like, well, this is what happened. And he's like, was she really so hideous? And she was like, yeah, kind of. And yeah, so she's just, Sarah's like, you know what? I'm good. I'm heading out for the day. I don't want to be in the house 
with some child that says such terrible things. So she gets dressed in her going out black attire with her jaunty little cap. And she's like, I'm heading out. We don't know where. There's a good chance she got someone else out there. If he's got people, she probably got people. So then Jonathan now is talking with Angelica, who is awake and is like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, he says he can't have some odd looking being casting all these like views on his character. And so she convinces Jonathan to not see Leia. He wants to, but I think she's, she defends her sister to him. So he never goes in to see her. So then Angelica goes into her dressing room, her room, and she's getting dressed and she's talking and you hear another voice talking to her as well. And then they show Leia. They show Leia's face as well, getting dressed in a similar outfit. She is talking to her sister. They just don't sh- ever show them standing next to each other. It's mm. more just like back and forth. So now it comes to some time later, Jonathan has gotten a new secretary to take his notes. And he's already hovering around her like the creep that he is. It's been like a day. And he's like, oh, I would hope that you would, you know, stay with me and have some sherry or whatever. And she's like, she's into it. She's into it a little bit. She's like, okay. So then it cuts to, so I guess he can only do it in the church. You think it's a kink? I mean, it kind of seems like it is a little bit. The fact that he prays and like... Oh man, that's fucked up. I'm like, don't, don't talk during it like that. Why are you... That's so... Makes it so much worse. And yeah, so then it cuts to Leia and she's listening to the outside of the doors of the church and you can hear him doing his prayer thing and he's in there with the secretary and they're doing it or whatever. But then it's unfortunate because then at that same time they have this scene where they show... Is that supposed to be the Virgin Mary or an angel? I think, I think it's an angel. I think so. Well, but, no, no, it looks like the Virgin. It's a breastfeeding woman. There's a woman breastfeeding a but child. It's, it's not portrayed the way you usually see the nativity. No. But it, it could be it? No, I, I don't think it is because there's a, two other little cherubic little angel babies. Honestly, it looks like secular art from the you know early modern period. Yeah, so I, I don't, don't know. Really They're know. all naked. But she's like in a cloth and like um, there's a, a picture of a woman breastfeeding and while the two other babies wait to breastfeed. And I was just like, oh, don't show the woman breastfeeding <laughs> during this scene. So it's like, it's so much worse. You hear the guy praying and like doing what he's doing. And then you just see this scene. And so then they're done. And the secretary lady comes out and she comes into the same living room area. And she starts to walk out because she was going to get ready to leave. And that's when Leia sneaks up behind her like Arya Stark style. Yeah. And <laughs> slits her throat, which you don't get a whole lot of throat slitting in Tales from the Crypt. So then now it's nighttime and stuff too. Like she's left her there and Sarah came home. So the wife is coming home now. She's back from whatever errands she was running and she's back and she's just like walking around the dark living room. She doesn't see the secretary at first. See, even then though, she's like, she walks over to the door where the church is. And even then she's like afraid to knock. Cause I think she's probably walked in on him before. Yeah. Like, I think she just never, like she just gives him that space because she kind of has to in the situation that she's in. Because she really does, I think, truly hate him. <laughs> but she's kind of just stuck. And she goes to knock on that church door, but then she decides not to. She turns around and she sees Leia who jumps out. And she's Leia's got some blood all over her. And Leia's just spouting all of those Bible verses. You know, smiting the, smiting the sinner. I mean, you got to give it to her. At least she's consistent. Yeah, she's got the whole thing of like, I'm a messenger. It's my heritage. This is my, my religion. I got to kill the harlots. So. She, she is the worst nightmare of like hypocrites that talk the talk but do not walk the walk. <laughs> I mean, it's still not right, but she thinks it is. But Sarah's like, what are you talking about? She pushes Leia out of the way. And then that's when she sees the secretary. And she does this really great scream with her hands up around, around her face. And she's freaking out. And so her scream calls Jonathan out. And Leia has ran off, like as soon as she got pushed out of the way. And so Jonathan comes out and he thinks that, he thinks that Sarah did it. What did you do? We're going to be screwed. And she's like, I didn't do this. I love how his first response is to blame his wife. Yeah, I know. I mean, of course, in his mind, he's probably like, oh, she finally got sick of my my crap that I do and and cracked. This might be a little my fault, but I'm still going to yell at her. Oh, he never. I don't think he has enough. (laughs) Yeah, there is enough. You know, self-awareness to ever take, you know, responsibility for anything. But I guess he thought maybe she was faking the screams because her screaming, she looks disgusted. And And traumatized. And traumatized, yeah. And she's like, it wasn't me. It was Leia. And she goes to point to Leia and Leia's gone. And she's like, oh, she's gone. I don't know. And so he's still mad at her. Jonathan's like, you ruined us. Sarah's like, I don't even know who this is. So that means that I guess this is the secretary's first day. So Jonathan's panicking. He's like, how am I going to come back from this? And then he's like, you know what? Maybe I don't have to. I'll just, I think he's going to try to blame it on Sarah. 
like a self-defense thing. So he puts the hands around Sarah's neck and he starts choking her. He's going to kill Sarah too. I don't know if he's planning on burning the house down or what. Somehow he, he... Yeah, he just kills her. He kills her. He does this thing where he just snaps her neck. And you can tell, like, he's astounded, but he... I think he almost kind of liked it. Like, oh, snapping no, her like neck. This, this, this fucker... You know. So so now he's panicked. So Sarah is laying on top now of the secretary on the couch. So there's just two dead women now. And then it shoots to the bedroom. Angelica's in the bedroom now with the cross and she's crying and she's like on her side and it's dark in there. And so Jonathan comes in and he's immediately like, okay, so some stuff has gone down and we, I gotta go. I think he wants her to come with him. Mm. He's like, I gotta go. Maybe we'll go to America. I don't know. <laughs> We're gonna go somewhere. We gotta start all over again. He's gonna pull an H.H. Holmes. <laughs> yeah. And just, and just run away to another place and claim he's someone else. I mean, you can do that then. He's like, we'll just go. Would you like that? You want to come with me? And she won't turn around. And she's like crying and upset. And he goes to turn her over. And it's Leia. Uh, Leia's saw, there. No one saw that coming. It's Leia. And she's like, I knew you were going to try to like ruin all this and split this up and take her away from me. Oh my God. You're precious. Please listen to me. Something has happened. I... I need to go away for a while. I, perhaps America, I, I want to start all over again. I, I want you to come with me. Just the two of us. Would you like that? Hmm? Angelica? What's wrong? came here this would happen yeah i knew you'd try and take her away from me no. and look what your sins have created <gasps> repent sinner <gasps> the great day of wrath is come and who shall be able to stand he's never met leia so he sees her face and he is also appalled <laughs> by her face because he's so fucking precious yeah He's like, oh my gosh, my wife was right. It's terrible. And so she just goes off again. She's got these fun, like, crazy monologues. Oh, no, it's, it's some real revelations kind of stuff. Yeah. It's interesting because if you remember earlier in the episode, he was going on this, like, very soft, kind of, like, wishy-washy theology that was very, like, well, what is the nature of sin? No, Leia's having none of that. <laughs> she's she like, I'll a, tell you your sin. She is 100% fire and brimstone, and I'm here for that. And she's got this... Oh, the knife. I think she's got the knife she slit the throat with. And so she's yelling at him, and she runs up to him and stabs him just right in the stomach. Yeah. He immediately falls back, and she just keeps stabbing his leg and just stabbing at him. A lot of stabbing. A lot of stabbing. A lot of knife stuff. And he reaches up, and there's this another crucifix on top of the wall, or on the wall, and he grabs it and smacks her in the face. And then she goes down, and he takes that iron bronze crucifix and sticks it right into her chest and kills her. And so right as she dies, she like leans her head back and then her head rotates 180 degrees. <laughs> her head rotates 180 like an degrees like an owl. It's Angelica's face. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they're kind of like a malignant, not quite, but like a malignant. Like a malignant. They share the face and then I guess they just flip the hair over back and forth. It doesn't make much sense. And that's okay, because it's Tales from the Crypt and we're along it, it for the ride. It doesn't have to. But at first I was like, I'd forgotten about the head flip. I thought it was just like she flips her hair back and forth, like Willow Smith. She whips her hair back and forth. Anyway, oh, so God. she flips her hair back and forth. <laughs> and then she would just have it, the face. But then I was like, well, her hands are going the same direction. It's not like Malignant, where it would, you know, right. makes no sense again to where in Malignant, the next day her arms should hurt really badly. Because she'd been running around crazy backwards, but it don't. And then you find out, like, with the head turn, I was like, oh, yeah, that's right, the head turn. So that makes more sense. So, like, earlier when she was talking to that voice or to Leia, it was just her from the, you know, switching. I guess they were just switching their heads back and forth. But again, it doesn't make any sense because they're twisting in that 180 degree. Their neck does not get all bun bunched up. It doesn't break their trachea. It doesn't do anything. But they're able to switch their heads. Just don't question it. I don't question it. Just it's fun. It's a fun it. twist. Know, you're not supposed to think about it. It's these a fun things, right? twist, <laughs> and Jonathan is completely astounded. Like, he is just like repulsed and astounded, and oh my gosh. And that's also why the lady in the beginning made that weird face real quick, because when the baby came out, it had two faces. 
Yeah, so that's what it is. And this has been done similarly before, kind of in a better way, I think. People um, who live in brass hearses mm. had the, con- oh, uh, the conjoined twins. I like that one a little better. Even the Crypt Keeper's father was a two-faced man. Um, they also have My Brother's Keeper. That's another one where they're conjoined at the hip. Yeah, that yeah. one's kind of a fun one. So this one's kind of a similar situation, just not, not quite. But it's still a fun little twist at the end. And when you think about some of the stuff that happened earlier, it makes sense. Also, I really can't see her hiding her sister for that long. Eventually, it would have been found out. She should have probably just said something. <laughs> but it's a fun little ending. And it's, I think it was well done for what it was. And yeah, so that's the end of the episode. So then it cuts back to the Crypt Keeper, still in the little jazzy club. And he's singing and playing. And, and it cuts down and all the strings on his guitar are now veins. Broken? Veins or oh, something. Oh, it's like gut. They're like literal, literal cat guts. Yeah, it's like <laughs> little, little bloody strings. And... It's gross. And he like strums them and they're like, and there's sound. And then he laughs and he's having a fun time. He's missing a tooth in the front. He's having a good time. (laughs) Crypt Keeper, you're so punny. And the best Crypt Keeper pun is... Poor Jonathan invites his daughters to stay with him and ends up aghast in his own home. I guess he knows now he'll never tear them apart. So, again, that's the end of the episode. There is no IMDb trivia for this episode. The next one is Season 7, Episode 11, Confession. Mike, thank you so much for being on this episode. Of course. Did you have fun? Did you have ton of fun talking I, about I, I had <laughs> so much fun dealing with religious hypocrisy and seeing that, again, like, I, I, I derive a certain level of schadenfreude from overly religious people who use the word of God to get earthly things like that and use it to abuse their positions running into someone who literally believes yeah and and will judge them based upon a higher power and i she, love that dynamic and she really leia really didn't let anyone get a word in like that she yep. was... <laughs> no leia's based <laughs> okay and thank you all so much for downloading and listening to this episode. If you want to follow the Good Evening Kitties podcast, you can do so on Instagram at the underscore Gek underscore podcast. You can also follow on Twitter at Gek Podcast. That's G-E-K Podcast. There's a Facebook page as well. There's also an Instagram page for Gus, the pod cat, at a sweet cat named Gus. You can also email me at goodeveningpod at gmail.com. And if you leave a review, I will read it on the podcast. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Thanks again for downloading, listening, and bye. Mike, say bye. Goodbye.